Welcome to the Hopewell Reformed Church broadcast of a portion of last week's service. Sunday services are at 8.45 and 10.30 in the morning. Sunday school is provided at each service. We now join Pastor Taylor Holbrook and the congregation at the service. I introduced to you one of my good friends for a long, long time. Jeff Monroe and I were in seminary together, and if you read my In Touch this week, you know that... Um, that I had given him a box of uh, baseball cards from my more fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Riley, in Brooklyn. Jeff is now um, the Vice President for Development at Western Theological Seminary. So, uh, when, when Jeff heard that Tony Kanji was, was playing, he said, is that the same Tony Kanji that wrote songs for Young Life? I said, yeah, that's the same Tony Kanji. So uh, we probably should have done... Jesus is the rock and he rolls my blues away. We don't do that too much here, you know, so, but that's cool. But Jeff went on uh, through West Michigan Young Life, was an area director. He ended up uh, in Europe as the director of Young Life for Western Europe and now is back at the seminary, a man of, of genius, of wit, of wisdom. So it is an extreme pleasure for me to welcome to our pulpit this morning, Jeff Monroe. Thank you, brother. I love you, man. Where's the check? <laughs> the presentation. You got it. Yeah. Here's the here's the beautiful thing is he said I have to give it back to him so he can give it to me again at the second service. But thank you, very much for that. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for the introduction, Taylor. That was uh, flowery. Um, I don't know about that genius part. I'm going to talk to my wife. Um, I want to read uh, two pieces of scripture. The first is a psalm we actually just sang uh, or heard sung, uh, a little bit of Psalm 91. For that, uh, would you pray with me? Lord, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Jesus Christ our only concern. Amen. Let's listen uh, to Psalm or read together Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that waits, that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked because you've made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You'll tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of the Lord for us. And then uh, Luke 20. Three. Is there a, uh, a description of uh, Jesus on the cross? We're going we're gonna to read verses uh, 32 through 38. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Well, Taylor mentioned Kathleen Norris. I'm a a big fan of the writer Kathleen Norris. And I want to start by sharing a poem of hers called Imperatives. It's simply a number of commands from Scripture put together in a poem. It goes like this. Look at the birds. Consider the lilies. Drink ye all of it. Ask. Seek. Knock. Enter by the narrow gate. Do not be anxious. Judge not. Do not give dogs what is holy. Go. Be it done for you. Do not be afraid. Maiden, arise. Young man, I say, arise. Stretch out your hand. Stand up. Be still. Rise. Let us be going. Love. Forgive. Remember. Kind of sums it all up, doesn't it? There's much activity suggested in this poem. Rise, go, enter, seek, knock, ask. Words that all suggest action. But love, forgive, remember. In a sense, those are actions, but they're actions that take place in our heads and in our hearts as much as anywhere else. They have more to do with being than with doing. And as such, they're much more difficult. And of these three, is there anything that's more difficult than forgiving? How did Jesus do it? How did He muster the courage and the strength and the ability and the compassion, the love, the kindness to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do as they nailed him to the cross. Now, I'm not Dutch. It's a little disclaimer. But I have lived for so long among Dutch people in West Michigan that uh, a few years ago, my wife and I got carried away and we actually moved to the Netherlands. And we spent 2009 and 2010 living in a city called Dordrecht, about 20 miles uh, southeast of Rotterdam in the province of South Holland. And I want to try to answer the questions I just asked about forgiveness by telling you some stories about some things that we saw and experienced when we lived in the Netherlands. On back-to-back days a few years ago, We visited the house of Anne Frank in Amsterdam. And the next day, visited the house of Corrie ten Boom in Harlem. And that's Harlem, the Netherlands. Not Harlem, just down the road from here. I wonder how many of you have visited either of those houses. My guess is more of you know the name Anne Frank than the name Corrie ten Boom. But do you know their stories? Anne Frank was a young Jewish girl who kept what has now become perhaps the world's best-known diary as she and her family hid from the Nazis in the upper floors of the building that housed her father's business in Amsterdam during the Second World War. Corrie ten Boom was a middle-aged woman already when World War II started. And along with other members of her family, she worked with the Dutch underground to save Jews using a famous hiding place that was built into her home in a city only a few miles from Amsterdam. The residents of both the Frank House and the Ten Boom House were eventually betrayed to the Nazis and all were sent to concentration camps. Only one person from each family survived the war. 
In the Frank house, it was Anne's father, Otto. And in the Ten Boom house, it was Corey. The two houses of these families are now museums with much in common. And yet, in other ways, they're remarkably different. The Anne Frank house is overwhelmingly dark and sad. The windows are still covered with blackout paper, and it's bare. There's not a stick of furniture inside of it because when Otto Frank came back from Auschwitz, that's the way that it was. The Nazis had taken, had robbed everything out of their house. It's haunting as you move from room to room, and you feel as if you don't dare speak above a whisper. There's this wonderful, large picture of Anne as you come into the place, and she's so cute and alive and vibrant and, and fun. And, and, and then you go, and there's this bookcase, this hidden book, this bookcase that has this hidden stairwell behind the bookcase, and it's incredibly steep to climb up those stairs. And as I was climbing those stairs, I was thinking, this, this really happened. You know, it's not just something from a book or from a movie. This really happened, and it really happened here. And the heaviness inside those rooms is almost too much to bear. Some people start crying as they, as they go up that staircase and simply cry all the way as they move from room to room. There's a quote from a Holocaust survivor on a wall that says, one single Anne Frank moves us more than the countless others who suffered, just as she did, but whose faces remain hidden in the shadows. Perhaps it's better that way. If we were capable of taking in the suffering of all those people, we should not be able to live. Why do we know the name of Anne Frank and not know the name of six million others? Well, one reason is because it's possible to get our minds around her, her suffering and her family's suffering. But, but it's impossible, it's incomprehensible for us to imagine that same suffering six million times over. Anne Frank has become a symbol of the Holocaust, of the tragedy of so many lives that were destroyed. You feel her innocence as you, as you walk through the house. There are still pictures of movie stars glued to the wall that she had cut out of movie magazines. Just a just a young teenage girl. They're the only decorations left in this dark and desolate place. And the Frank family, by the way, they weren't Dutch. They were Germans. Otto Frank had served honorably in the German army in World War I. But when the Nazis came to power in the 1930s, it became apparent that Hitler was targeting Jewish people and the family fled to the Netherlands, thinking that they'd be safe there because the Netherlands had been neutral in the First World War. And when the Netherlands was invaded, then the family had no choice but to hide. And as you walk through the empty rooms, the horror of having no choice but to hide feels like an overwhelming burden on your shoulders. What a contrast, then, to visit the home of Corey Ten Boom in Harlem a day later. The Ten Boom house is warm and full of light, and visitors are invited inside to sit on the family's furniture. Unlike the Franks who had no choice but to hide, the Ten Booms made a conscious choice, a choice to open their home to Jewish people and to help them to be part of the Dutch underground after the Netherlands was invaded. The Anne Frank House is visited by millions of people each year. There's a, a permanent line that, that goes around a block there, people to get in. The Ten Boom House is visited by thousands who come at appointed times and enter from a side door off an alley, and the Ten Boom Watch Shop is still in business in the front of the house. The museum behind is free to enter, and it's staffed by Dutch volunteers who were eager to tell the story of what happened to the Ten Boom family and to say the message that Corrie Ten Boom spent the rest of her life proclaiming after being released from a concentration camp. The simple message that Jesus is victor. It's estimated that the Ten Booms helped save 800 Jews during the war. 
As you enter the family room, the living room, you see the Bible that belonged to Corey's father, Casper. And that Bible is open to Psalm 91, the psalm that we just read. It's his favorite, was his favorite psalm. The psalm about living in the shelter of the Most High. And Casper Tenboom was a watchmaker, and he had an enormous, long, white beard. And the Jewish people that lived with him called him Father Abraham. <laughs> or they called him Moses <laughs> because they said he looked like one of the patriarchs. And as a watchmaker, he was more artist and craftsman than businessman. He refused to acknowledge that the other watchmakers in town were his competition. He called them all his colleagues, even though those colleagues would come and take advantage of his good nature. They'd come visit him simply to spy out his shop and see what his products were and see what, their, what his prices were. He was 84 years old when the Gestapo invaded his house and took him to jail. And when he was brought to prison, one of these German officers mercifully said to him, you're an old man. You're, you're, you're too old to be mixed up in this. Just tell us you won't do this anymore and we'll let you go home. And you know what he said? He said, if you let me go and a person who's in need comes to my door tomorrow, I will help him. And the German officer said, you're going to die in here. And he said, it would be the greatest honor in my life to sacrifice myself for God's chosen people. He died in prison 10 days later. His daughter Betsy, who was sent along with her sister Corey to a concentration camp, also died, along with several cousins, nieces, nephews of their family. How do we account for the differences in these two houses? both commemorating the same events, but with such different atmospheres and feelings. The Frank House stands as a haunting, grim reminder of the suffering of the Jewish people, a, a, a statement of the worst people can do to other people, a story that must never be forgotten. In my little Dutch town of Dordrecht, I used to take my dog, this sounds picturesque, but it was always rainy and cold, so it's not that picturesque. <laughs> but we used to take my dog for a walk on a dike above a canal, and there was a Nazi bunker that sat less than a mile away from where my house was. And a farmer had taken that Nazi bunker and repurposed it and had all of his hay and his tools and things like that inside of it. And I thought, boy, if ever there was an example of, of uh, be beating a sword into a plowshare, there it was. But see, the Dutch people won't tear those bunkers down. They'll repurpose them, they'll use them, but they won't tear them down because they will not forget what has happened. There was a black sign on a street in Dordrecht with a gold star of David on it. And the following words were written in Dutch. Je moet het je kinderen vertellen. And even with my elementary grasp of the Dutch language, I could tell that that said, you must tell your children. The world must be told about the horrors of the Holocaust, about the terrors of religious persecution. But then the Ten Boom House stands as this testimony to the Christian faith of a simple watchmaker and his two spinster daughters who believe that Jesus is victor. Or as I saw it on a plaque in their house in Dutch, Jesus is Oberwinner. At a time when the Nazis sang Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Allies, the Ten Boom said, No, Jesus is Oberwinner, not you. There is light and air in that house because there's hope in that house. Not human hope, but Christian hope. Hope in the resurrection, hope that this world is not all there is. The deaths of their family members weren't any less painful or tragic, 
but they face them with a belief that there's more to our existence than what we can see, taste, feel, and touch. In the depths of the concentration camp, shortly before her death, Betsy Ten Boom told her sister, Corey, that she must survive the camp and she must tell the world that there is no hole so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And Corey did that. She spent the rest of her life touring the world, telling the story of what had happened to her and her family during the war. And as she did that, she quickly realized that the biggest message of all that she had to share was one word, one simple word, forgiveness. That the heart of Christianity is forgiveness. She felt called to bring that message of forgiveness all over the world. She was tireless in doing that. And she realized that her words had no meaning unless she was able to forgive the people that had killed her family, that had killed her father, that had killed her sister, and that had tormented and tortured her. She could not tell others about Jesus unless she experienced the reality of forgiveness in her own life. And in the hiding place, she tells this particular story. She says, Germany was in ruins after the war, and of all the places I visited, it was the place where the hunger for my story was the greatest. The cities were ash and rubble, and more terrifyingly, the hearts and minds of the people were ash and rubble as well. And one day I was speaking at a church service in Munich when I saw one of the former SS men who had stood guard at the shower, at the shower room door in the concentration camp of Ravensbrück. He was the first of my former jailers I had been face to face with. And as I saw him, suddenly it all came back to me. Groups of mocking men, our heaps of clothing scattered on the floor, and my sister Betsy's pain-blanched face. And he came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming, and bowing and saying, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein, to think that as you say, God has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often about the need to forgive, couldn't move my hand. My hand stayed at my side. Anger, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, and as they did, I saw the sin of my own thoughts. Jesus Christ had died for this man, too. Was I going to ask for more? Lord, I said, forgive me and help me forgive him. I tried to smile. I could not. I tried to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot do this. I cannot forgive him. God, please give me your forgiveness. My hand came up. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened from my shoulder and along my arm and through my hand. I felt a current that seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang love for this stranger, a love that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it's not on our forgiveness any more than it is on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When God tells us to love our enemies, he gives us, along with a command, the love itself. Isn't that a beautiful story? When God asks us to do something, He gives us the ability to do it. When God calls us to something, He gives us the resources. If the power to forgive were naturally in our hearts, we wouldn't have such a hard time doing it. Forgiveness isn't easy, and it certainly isn't cheap. For the next six weeks of Lent, we'll all be focused, along with Christians all over the world, on what it cost God to forgive. There is nothing cheap or easy about it. And most times we have to force ourselves to do it. 
As Corey Ten Boom has written elsewhere, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Forgiveness is a gift from God, and when we have a hard time forgiving, we simply should ask God to help us do it. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer and say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or in other words, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, we're acknowledging that forgiveness is a web that stretches from God to us, then that allows us to begin to forgive others. Forgiveness comes from God, and only through God can we find the compassion to do it. Now, forgiveness, Tony prayed about forgiving and forgetting. Forgiveness does not start with forgetting. Well, God can do that. God says, I remember your sins no more. People ask, how am I supposed to forgive someone who abused me or did, who did some other terrible thing to me? Am I supposed to pretend that that never happened? No. God can forgive and forget, but we can't. The power of both the Anne Frank House and the Corey Ten Boom House is in their testimony to the horror of what happened. It would be a mistake to somehow gloss over that, to somehow pretend that that never happened. Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting as much as it does, and it also doesn't mean you have to trust someone again. It doesn't mean that you have to pretend it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that you have to put yourself back into a vulnerable position again. It doesn't excuse what someone has done, but it means letting go. It means not letting an act or a person have power over you anymore. Forgiving doesn't mean abuse me some more. It doesn't mean walk all over me again. But it does mean, I found this quote from a writer named C.R. Strahan, and I don't know who he is. I don't think he's a Christian. I'm going to tell you the way that he wrote it, and then I'm going to tell you the way I think as a Christian that we should understand it. He said, relieving yourself of the burden of being a victim, letting go of the pain, and transforming yourself from a victim to a survivor. And I would say, humanly, I don't think we can do that. It's not relieving yourself. It's letting God relieve you. Letting God give you the power to relieve that sense of being a victim and moving and seeing yourself in a new light as someone who has survived and someone who is stronger because of it. Well, as you know, this is the season of Lent. It started last Wednesday. And you also know that Lent lasts for 40 days. And 40 days is roughly one-tenth of the year. And there are all sorts of stories in the Bible where God commands people to set aside one-tenth of something for God's use. And they call it a tithe, the word that means a tenth. And that's where we get the idea that we're supposed to give a tenth of our income away. It's a tithe set aside for God's use. And Lent is a tithe of a year. A tenth of a year. So you're being invited to set aside one-tenth of this year for God's use. And historically, the church has encouraged special disciplines during Lent to help make that happen, especially the discipline of fasting, and the discipline of prayer. Somehow over the years, that discipline of fasting has kind of changed into this idea of giving up something for Lent. And so we give up cookies or we give up chocolates or soft drinks or alcohol or something like that. But the church never imagined that Lent was going to be a diet aid. <laughs> it imagined Lent as a tenth of the year. One tenth to practice Christian discipline more faithfully. And in some traditions, there's just as much emphasis on adding something during Lent than, than there is on taking something away during Lent. And so let me make just one suggestion for your observation of Lent this year. That you both take away something and that you add something. This Lent, why not fast from bitterness? And why not add the discipline of forgiveness? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.